Jake Roxander, welcome to the stage right side with James Whiteside. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yay! We are truly on the stage right side as I have broken into yet another of my colleagues' dressing rooms. <laughs> Today I'm recording from Hiseo's dressing room, principal dancer Hiseo, and she doesn't know I'm here, um, so I apologize. I guarantee you she's not listening to my podcast. She doesn't have to know. We'll never tell. Uh, so thank you, Elizabeth. I call her Queen Elizabeth, the first and only. <laughs> So Jake Roxander is a soloist with American Ballet Theater. He is, uh, one might say, a breakout star of American Ballet Theater. He has been bringing um, absolute delight to audiences in everything he's done in the past couple of seasons at American Ballet Theater. And I'm a huge fan of his dancing. Um, but I hate him as a person, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> yes, as a person is awful. So Jake, you're in stage makeup right now. For those of you watching the YouTube video, this will live on YouTube as well. Don't forget to go check it out and uh, get me some ad money. Uh, you are in full yeah. stage makeup. You are beat for the gods. <laughs> what are you doing in Like Water for Chocolate this week? Um, so I am doing uh, Ranch Worker and Like Water for Chocolate. Uh, and that's a core part, correct? Um, well, technically, Royal Ballet was actually a soloist part. Okay. But it, it is it is kind of a core to ballet part in the sense that um, you're in a group and How many you do people? all of the group dances. It's eight people. Eight people. Do you have to group. move the set? You do. You have yeah. to move a couple tables. That's one of my least favorite things to have to do as a dancer is when you have to be also the stage hand. Yes. Yes. But, you know, I get it, and it makes sense for this show, so yeah. good on you. Um, um, so, but you do, as a soloist, you have to do solo, uh, core parts sometimes, right? What's the, like, rule there? It's a little confusing, but um, generally with, like, a new contract, I'm, I'm still kind of uh, learning the ropes, so to speak. But um, when you get a new contract, it's like there's a, a limited amount of time that they can use you for core to ballet mm -hmm. if they still need you. It's like usually a year or um, two, right? I think so, yes. So after after that certain amount of time passes, then you're more um, exclusively no. a soloist, mm -hmm. yeah, and you're more senior. Um, and the only other thing I'm doing this week is uh, Lead Revolutionary. So oh yeah, really that's fun. fun. I'd yeah. love that dance. Yeah, it was my favorite thing in the whole ballet when yeah. we saw it. Um, London. And you haven't done it yet, or have you? No, I haven't done it. Okay, this we've got a debut. Debut. They're still happening. I'm gonna turn the air conditioning off because it's noisy and it's freezing. I don't in like here. that. And we gotta keep you warm for the performance. <laughs> there we go. Oh my gosh, I'm freezing. They nice. love to keep these dressing rooms absolutely sub zero. <laughs> and now you can probably hear us better. So, what else have you danced this season? Oh man, um, a bunch of things. Uh, Lensky was another debut. I was like, uh, just yeah, super honored to do that. That was a lot of fun. Um, I felt like it really stretched me in a lot of ways, um, mm. more than just my arabesque. Um, oh, ha -ha, but um, and he's got jokes. <laughs> oh yes. Uh, <laughs> so, so Lensky, um, I did uh, Benno in Swan Lake. Um, That's the the pas de trois guy who's yes. um, who's Prince Siegfried's um, let's say best friend. Wink, I'm winking into the camera <laughs> for all of you out there. They're best friends. They're best friends. <laughs> um, so I did that. I did Neapolitan as mm -hmm. well in Swan Lake. Uh, Romeo and Juliet. I uh, came back to Mercutio, which mm -hmm. is one of my favorites. Um, I'm leaving something out. Oh, like Water for Chocolate. Uh, I did the role Evans in first act. No, and... that's um, Wolfworks. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll do that again. Um, in Wolfworks, Boom. I did the role of Evans yes. in the first act. In and that is act... also um, Septimus's wink, wink, best friend. Yes, this is... Um... I'm sensing a theme here. Oh, yes. We've got a lot of like... Um... <laughs> yeah, never mind. I'm going to stop. <laughs> and then... <laughs> Now you're doing Lead Revolutionary and um, yes, Ranch Worker. Ranch Worker. I think that's mostly everything. I know I've left a couple things out. Is there a role yes. that you've done that surprised you? Um, like you didn't think you'd be doing it, but you have done it? You know, honestly, Lensky was probably one of those. Yeah. I, I wasn't sure I would be um, just cast in a part like that, because I think Lensky is Sure, there's there's some hard technical steps, there's some pirouettes and um, some some yeah technique so to speak. But uh, a lot of it is 
your lines. There's a lot of arabesques and there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a really long pot at the beginning. Mm. And um, I don't know, he's not a princely character, but he, he has a regalness to him that I think I'm oftentimes put into the other box mm. of your, you know, I can be seen as the, the trickster, you're a little shorter, so you can't really uh, carry a role like that in a way. Of course, I don't, I, I try not to be that. And um, I think ABT has been very uh, gracious with their opportunities and not putting me in a box, but Do you that think, was one that took me by surprise. Yeah, I mean, something you just said about being shorter and being part like sort of typecast in these mm -hmm. like roles that are sort of viewed to be less regal. Like, right. how do you, I look at somebody like Armand, who does Siegfried, who does mm -hmm. Romeo, mm -hmm. um, and I was having this conversation with some of my friends actually recently, because when you really think about the world we idealize and the one we want to live in, mm -hmm. um, even in ballet, it's like you, I'm trying to say this really sensitively, you don't want to be in a like sizest, ageist, heightest society, even though ballet is an aesthetic art form. Right. And so like you getting opportunities like Lenski are really fantastic. Herman doing Siegfried and Romeo is fucking awesome, pardon my French, <laughs> um, and make complete sense to me. Um, yeah. So what, what roles do you feel like have been historically done by essentially tall people mm -hmm. that you want to get in on? Um, and how tall are you? And if you don't, are you cool talking about those? Yeah, of course. No, I'm happy to. Um, I think it's 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 a little bit of a uh, maybe stigma isn't the right word, but especially nowadays, um, this generation, it's it's like something that I think can be talked about a little bit more. So no, I'm absolutely happy to. hit it. Um, you know, Siegfried is definitely a dream role mm -hmm. of mine. Um, just uh, Swami. Is Why is that? Ballet and, just because it's so iconic. I think it's it's a it's a it's an iconic ballet. I have. I think it was one of the first ABT DVDs I saw. I mean, I just grew up on a lot of that music. Yeah. And um, just just that that ballet itself. So like that that would be just uh, very special to me. I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think yeah. I mean, there's 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 a lot of reasons, but. That, that would be a really special one, and that is, by definition, a very princely role. So, generally speaking, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's a lot of taller men that have done it, and, um, you know, you're wearing, you're out there with white tights and white ballet shoes, and so, you know, you can't hide a lot of your, your uh, weaknesses, um, and, you know, you're, 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 it's like you said, ballet is an aesthetic art form, so it's like you want to be aesthetically pleasing, and, um, and do you, yourself well and, like, what does that have to do with being tall or short? Sorry, I, you know, that is not a good question for me because I don't really know. Mm. I think it's it's very funny that if you were to ask a random person, you know, on the street that maybe knew something about ballet and you said, who are some of the greatest ballet dancers to ever live? Generally speaking, people are going to say, Mikhail Baryshnikov, Rudolf Nureyev, Majitsky, mm. you know, they're going to say short like, kings. a lot of these people that are that are, you know, my height if not a little shorter. Mm. Nureyev was I think an inch or two taller than me. Mm. But um And so me and all the other tall guys are disgusting, I guess. You're awful. <laughs> no, it's just one of those things where it's like I, I it doesn't have to be a certain way. And, I agree. And I think like watching my brother do Siegfried, he brought something that was so fresh to the role. Um, he brought an innocence. Tell, the, tell my li listeners where your brother is. Sure. Um, my brother, Ashton Roxander, is a principal with uh, the Philadelphia Ballet. Um, and I was actually at the Philadelphia Ballet for uh, a year before I joined Studio Company. It mm. was then the Pennsylvania Ballet. So you joined Studio Company at like 19 or something? Yes. And how old are you now? So. 22. 22. Okay. Yes. So were you only in Studio Company for one year then? No, I was there for two years. Um, it was w one season. My first season in Studio Company was during COVID. So uh -huh. that was during the, the, the bubbles. Mm -hmm. So we had two bubbles where we did our um, repertoire and we filmed it and put it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And then my second season, we were actually in the building. We okay. were actually at 890 Broadway. And yes. 
890 Broadway is the ABT Studios. It's in the exactly. Flatiron area of the city, and it's a pretty iconic building as far as the arts goes. A lot of um, Broadway shows are workshopped there, and television shows, and musicians rehearse there. I remember Beyonce walked in one day, and I almost lost my absolute mind. She got out of a, a Suburban, and I was like, oh my god. I did the same when yeah. I saw Hugh Jackman downstairs. Oh my, if I saw Hugh Jackman, I would be like, <laughs> Hugh Jackman, let's let's go to where where I want to be. <laughs> yeah, I, it was it was crazy. Yep. I stopped in my tracks a little mm -hmm. bit, and I just had to keep going. Mm -hmm. I saw Tyrion. Uh, what's his name? P Peter Dinklage. Once he oh he plays gosh. Tyrion Lannister in oh the Game, in Game of Thrones. I, I I've seen lots of people. New York. New York. New York. I love it. Okay, wait, back to <laughs> back to the hard-hitting facts. So, Siegfried, for nostalgic and iconic reasons, mm -hmm. give me some other roles that you have your eye on that might not typically be given to a shorter dancer. Um, Albrecht is a great role. Mm -hmm. Albrecht is one of my favorites. Um, Mine too. Giselle is a great ballet. Um, Je agree. <laughs> Um, so that would be that would be one and mm. yeah, it's like I said it's just funny because it's like for me personally if I have like an image of Albrecht in my head the first thing I think of is the me, too. me too exactly um, so it's funny that there's like that kind of like I said stigma there um, I think you know uh, taller guys are generally more quote unquote naturally better partners so I think that's something that that's like an idea that's been put into people's head, mm. whether that's because um, they're just naturally heavier or, you, you know, whatever. That? I am <laughs> calling you, no. Um, there, there's a lot that goes, <laughs> goes into it. But, um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I like to think that stigma is, is, is going away, you know, bit by bit. I don't think you're gonna have any trouble getting parts, Jake. So I, I, well, you, I, you just never know. It's daddy just, chill. <laughs> it's a left foot, right foot journey. It's just it like, also depends on the director and or the exactly. choreographer, or whatever. So exactly. I think there, there are, people are gonna have their, you know, preconceived notions about what right. they're looking for. Right. And you just better hope that it's people who are um, actively looking at things in a broader way than perhaps have been historically right and i mean ultimately it's just like it's not about how tall you are or how flexible your ankles are or whatever you know it's about just what you bring to the table the like, spirit so put, exactly i mean your your on-stage presence your charisma the way you uh portray the role your acting all of those things kind of mesh together and then of course the technique and all of that stuff is, is just equally as important. But it's, Yeah, like it's what are your priorities? Track. Like what would you say your top three priorities as a dancer are? Oh gosh, for a performance? Um, I mean, the technique. Mm. Um, gotta, gotta do the steps. I think that's fair. Yeah. Uh, that one should be in there. <laughs> um, I would say the acting, of mm. course. Um, I mean, I guess all that's left is just the energy. Like, what? how much energy you bring to the part. And when you when you go up in energy and when you go down, mm. um, I think that's hugely important. Um, so it's not just about the acting, but it's about how much intention you give certain things. Well, of course, yeah, I agree. Especially in theater, because theater is not film. I see, you know, I've seen a lot of dancers in my life that are actually quite good actors, but it, it, it's almost as if they're pretending the camera's in front of their face. Mm. And, you know, in the rehearsal studio, it can actually be quite powerful. But then I've heard of, you know, people in the audience being like, oh, that person looked a little flat to me. Mm. And you say, really? Mm. But it, you realize how far away the audience is. And I think that that's something that, you know, like, uh, we just keep talking about Misha. Like he's a he's a big hero of mine and a big influence on me. It's like um, he he could do things so over the top, and mm. I think there's a lot of moments where you have to tone things down. But well, besides I, the acting and technique, your energy level is huge. I totally agree with that, and I feel um, I feel like just my personal spirit is energetic, and mm -hmm. that is something that just naturally happens for me on stage. It's just like 
energy. Right. But um, as like talking about Misha and that generation's um, theatrical style, right? It was a whole different ball game. In that, I don't know, people just acted differently in the same way they acted differently in movies. Like mm -hmm. the uh, the general aesthetic of a time. Um, it's like a time capsule, and it, it's preserved in ballet, in film, in television, in books, in everything. Um, and I think when I look back on those performers, they do seem kind of melodramatic to me. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I absolutely love it. And I think when audiences can get lost in the artist's um, choices, right. they feel a connection to that artist. That being said, I don't think it's appropriate to go ham for the purpose of going ham. I yeah. think artists for like in storytelling have to be um, natural to them. Yeah, this is, yeah, that's what I was kind of going um, to say is like, the audience is gonna feel what you're gonna feel. So it's not necessarily like if I do this like Misha, it's going to read the same way. Mm -hmm. It's like that's not that's not the case. You know, you you have to take what's useful, discard what's not, and add what's uniquely your own to everything you do. Mm -hmm. um, well, I always think too, you can't fully erase yourself. No, no, yeah, um, yeah. Also, sorry, I'm getting on a lost on a tangent here, but <laughs> that's okay. when you think you're really slaying sometimes, like you could be really lost emotionally in a piece mm -hmm. or a full length or whatever it is. And you could be like losing your mind and like weeping on stage and like it could look like literal garbanzo beans from the audience. <laughs> and so yeah. it's all it's all part of like learning essentially right. what works, what doesn't work, stagecraft right. and all that beauty. Yeah. Oh, that's the end of my points. I have no other points. That's the yeah. end of the podcast. Is it? No, I'm kidding. Oh, God, okay. You're I was like, like yes. wow, that went by fast. No, no, I'm kidding. I said nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got Giselle and we've got Siegfried. What about choreographers that you haven't worked with that you'd really like to work with? Oh, gosh. I don't know. We're um, manifesting here, Jake. Get into it. Oh, God. Okay. Um, you know, Twyla's, Twyla's definitely one that I think is on most people's bucket mm -hmm. list. Uh, I've danced... Uh, quite a bit of her things before but I've never actually worked with her mm. in person so funny I just so, I interviewed Chloe earlier yeah. today and she said the same thing she really? said I really want to work with Twyla yeah, yeah it would it would be cool I mean it's like I've already had so many moments even now like doing your podcast where it's like you know if I have like a kids one day I'll be like you know yeah I danced with James Whiteside and I danced with these people and now and he's dead <laughs> and he's dead now um but you know that that is like kind of like a bucket list thing mm. almost for a, a dancer, especially in New York, like to, to meet Twyla and to work with Twyla would be amazing. She's amazing. I mean, I actually, I, I, do, I think I said I hadn't met her. I have met her, mm. I haven't worked with her. And she was she was very kind and she was very um, in character of what I've heard of her. Oh yeah, she's always Twyla. She's, Twyla's yeah. gonna Twyla. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Oh gosh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, I, off the top of my head, I'm like, you have know, you ever we'll has Ramonsky ever made anything on you? Uh, no, he's never choreographed anything okay. on me. No. Well, that that needs to happen. A manifesting <laughs> that for you. I've worked with him uh, quite a few times before, but I've never had something set on me. Yeah, that, that would be really that's interesting. That's like that's like pretty peak for for a ballet dancer. Yeah, yeah. I think especially dancing um, a lot of ballets for him um, and knowing who it was set on is really yeah. interesting because you can so much tell something like piano concerto was set on Ivan Vasiliev yeah. and um, oh this was set on Daniel Simpkin and mm -hmm. it's 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 almost obvious yeah. which I, I like in a choreographer I like you know maybe a typecast isn't the right word but I like it when choreographers come in and they understand the dancer that's in front of them and they set choreography that best suits them I yes. think that's okay I want that too you know yeah. like if someone's making a dance on me I don't want to yeah. To not suit my body and my abilities. Like, right. And right. then I'll just feel like a garbage dancer. You yeah. Know? I, I, I would argue it's part of the choreographer's mm -hmm. job to really know the dancer before they, you know, enter the studio. Boom. I mean, yes, but it's, <laughs> I also, as I've made a couple dances myself, and it's I, not always that way. You yeah. don't always co yeah. go into a situation knowing no. every single dancer. And it's not often that 
you do know every single dancer. I've been really lucky to work with ABT a couple times, yes. but then the other times when I've gone and dan I've made dances for people I've literally never met before, yes. I'm sussing out their abilities like in real time. And yeah. I'm like, okay, uh, like, what's your best pirouette? <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. No, it's actually, I should add that like, that makes a great choreographer great is like, it's like how they can like, like problem solve in the moment because I, I think some of the most talented choreographers I've ever met, even my own grandmother, my my uh, father's mother, she she did the most incredible pieces of choreography on kids that just could not do much of anything, mm. and she could come up with something that was so entertaining and satisfying to watch. And I think it's like just a just a you know all great choreographers have that in common too. So yes, in a perfect world, it's like yeah, you should know your dancer, mm. and that'll help the choreography, sure, but. Mm. I do also, on the flip side of that, think that that is a massive skill. Yeah. That's incredible. I think that's a great place to take a little break. Uh, we'll be right back. <laughs> We're back on the stage right side with Jake Roxander, ABT soloist. And I want to talk to you about your family. You live, or you exist within a ballet family, which sounds truly like my nightmare. <laughs> so your father, uh, and mother were both professional dancers? Uh, my father was a professional. Uh, Where did he work? In Canada? Or National Ballet yeah. of Canada, yeah. He was a principal there. Uh, he danced there for 20 years. And my mom didn't dance professionally. She danced in California and started teaching really young. And she that's kind of how she met my dad. My dad was actually teaching. And, and your grandmother was, was your your dad's mother was a choreographer or is she a dancer herself or was yes, she? Yes, she, she she was a dancer. I she didn't dance necessarily professionally, um, but she, she she was a jack of all trades. Mm. And I just come from a huge family of artists. They, they Most of my family members have at least dabbled in dancing along with other things. So um, yeah, a big family of artists. Okay, tell me your favorite thing about being in a dance family. Um, well, first and foremost, I've been, I feel for me personally, like, uh, very fortunate to have a dance family. I think it's brought us closer versus the opposite, which is not always the case. And I think that's my favorite thing about it is that we have a, a kinship and um, we relate on so many levels, but it's not just that we relate and we understand, you know, what, what he, my father or my mother understands what I say when I'm like, oh, I missed that pirouette and mm -hmm. you know, whatever. But it's, it's, it's not just that, but it's like, to actually share a dream with your other family members, just it brings you close like nothing else. Mm. It's like having a best friend and you're both kind of chasing the same same thing, you know. So you it's, have to kill them. Yeah, exactly. So they're your competition and you just, you know, it's it's just do a couple murders you know, and move on. Get you know, the, when get your the friend's part. sleeping, you just have to you know. Um <laughs> So I think that's that's really something that's special. It's like to to share a dream is, is a really incredible thing. And the fact that me and my brother both wore my father's costume, like for the role of Puck in Sir Frederick Ashman's The Dream, like my father's exact costume from National Ballet of Canada, like that's, that's like a cherry on top. That's yeah. just like ridiculous. I don't know how that happens, but it's just brought us so close. Has it been difficult? Um, I don't know. I. I think it'd be really hard to have one of my siblings be a the same gender as me and b in the same field. Like, <laughs> I feel like it would be really hard to compete with one of, one of my brothers for like companies or parts or like attention. Mm -hmm. Is that difficult for you too? Do you have a, a good working familial relationship? I think we I think we really do. Um, and you know we're in two different companies, so we're in two different worlds. Uh, so so. You know, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's yeah. maybe it's a little bit of a bummer. Like I, I would love to work with my brother more. Um, I love sharing the stage with him when I'm home. Mm. Um, but no, I think I think if there's any competition between the two of us, it's healthy competition. Yeah. Um, and you know, me being the younger brother by four years, it's like I've always kind of looked up to my brother. So it's kind of this unreachable thing, mm. in a way. Um, so I don't feel competition ever in 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 that sense. Um, I think. I think we help each other out where we need to be helped and we bond over things that that you know we share like like puck and like sometimes yeah, yeah. we share s certain roles like yeah. you know the upper oh room God, there's a wild. there's a chance i might do his part yeah because we have the same setter yeah oh it's, cool uh, it's philadelphia ballet so also i 
I'm very curious to hear what some of the toughest things about being in a ballet family are. You know, tough, but very good. I'm very grateful for I think having parents that know how hard it's going to be for you to be mm -hmm. quote unquote successful in this career um, is it was tough. It was, you know, it was, um, I had a great childhood, but also like I had to sacrifice a lot naturally in order to chase this dream mm -hmm. that so many people want. Tale as old as time. Right, right. It's like, and in ballet, it's mm -hmm. like, it's not even, you know, American football. It's mm -hmm. American. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, okay, you got to compete with the other 49 states. It's like, no, no, ballet is a global thing. So you're competing with, you know, some little boy in Cuba who mm -hmm. lives in a studio apartment with his 12 brothers and sisters. It's like, he wants it pretty bad, you know? A more, lot of people, it's their ticket you. out. You know, yeah, like, it's like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't, like, I don't know about that. I don't know about all that. I think in ballet, we drink the Kool-Aid so readily. And I think regardless of sort of home situations, um, I don't know, I think the way people work can be informed by their home life or their um, their privilege or their lack of privilege. Um, but I think the culture of ballet is a cult and <laughs> it's really beautiful and important and artistically fulfilling in some ways. And I think it can really be harmful in other ways. That being said, I love what I do and I'm really grateful for everything that it's given me. But like yeah. you said, the sacrifices are very real, especially when you're yeah. a young person and you don't quite understand like what you're sacrificing until you see other people your age and you're like, oh, oh, that looks way more fun right. than what I'm doing. Yes. And so you say your family understands that sacrifice but you still haven't told me what you don't like about being in a ballet family it's i really don't not like any of it i think it was like it, it you know it was hard but um like i was saying just like sacrificing a little bit of your social life and i didn't mm. go to parties and i didn't hang out with friends all the time and i i you know i did my two ballet classes every single day with my other contemporary classes and my rehearsals and um so that was hard at the time but uh for my family there's a huge philosophy in my house of like delayed gratification matters where it's like, you know, you have to be disciplined mm -hmm. and do what you don't want to do right now in order to be happier later. And I like want to say that, um, you know, I, I sacrificed a lot of things in my youth to, in, in order to work harder and, and uh, keep moving forward and improving in, in my ballet. But it's, it's so funny that like now that I'm kind of here, so to speak. It's not that I've arrived and I, I have found success and everything works perfectly. It's still a challenge, but it's like all of those things like came naturally. Now it's like my social life is my work life. Mm. And I go on tour with my friends and I hang out with my friends all the time. Mm. And you know, I get to do things like this. Like this is, it's it's an incredible thing. And it was so, so Yes, this worth is it. the height of your career. This is the height. There it, is nothing better. It's only down from the stage right back. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know, it's it's hard. There's nothing I don't like about being in a ballet family hmm. per se. I have seen some real train wrecks of ballet families, so I commend you and I am pleased for you. I, I'm i I'm just like purely grateful for it all because it, it, it's really, it's it's all my parents. My yeah. parents are just, you know, lovely people and I love them Good. very much and well, that's, I love my family, but it's, you know. That's beautiful. It's, it's I love my family too, they just don't, really care about ballet, which is also beautiful. You know, it, you, 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 uh -huh. <laughs> you win some, you lose some, but it's like everything happens for a reason. Everything, everything happens, happens for, reason, for one reason. For one reason, exactly. Mm -hmm. So quote James Whiteside. <laughs> okay. I don't know where to go with the raisin bit. <laughs> oh God. Do you know what you're doing in the fall season? Not exactly. Mm. Um, I, I would love to be in Upper Room. Okay, we were manifesting. I did this with Chloe as well. I'm manifesting. Manifesting Upper Room. I hope Twyla um, comes and coaches. That would be awesome, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so that would be that would be really fun. Uh, etudes, mm -hmm. you know, we'll You've done them already, that. yeah. Yes, I've done etudes. That's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. um, 
that was another one that my my dad did all the time same cool. part so you did this guy right exactly yeah. yes mazurka i've done that one too so, i can't say i was very good <laughs> Sure, I was fine. I was serviceable. It's it's just it's fun. It's great. It was Music fun. Yeah. Awesome. Banger. Straight it's up banger. It's, it's like banger. It's, it's very like John Williams does ballet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But who's the composer? Of Etudes? Yeah. I don't remember. I don't remember either. I'm I'm terrible with those things. What do we so know? Nothing. Things. But we sure can dance. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are your summer plans? So uh, I'm going home. Um, and where's home? Oregon, I, Oregon. I knew that, but I was just doing it for my listeners. Yes, in case anyone's wondering. Mm -hmm. um, Medford, Oregon, and then uh, I'm gonna work with my parents. Are you on taking a Conestoga to Oregon? Excuse me. Are you gonna be taking a Conestoga on the Oregon Trail back to Oregon? I'm going to be taking a plane. So you probably won't have to miserable. ford the river, and your horses are gonna die, and you might get dysentery. You have yes. no idea what I'm talking about because I'm <laughs> 700 years old. Um, you've never heard of Oregon Trail? Well, I've heard of the Oregon Trail, yes, of course. It's a computer game from like the Oh, 90s. you mean that Oregon Trail? Yeah. Oh, yes. I had no idea what you were talking about. It's like about. you yes. have died of dysentery. Yes, remember that sacrifice? Yeah, that, that's what I was talking about. It, it was his there was oxen. Not, there was not a lot of video games. We <laughs> had We was... Resort, and that was about it. So, oh my god, Wii Resort? That's that's a good one. It was a pretty good one. You had a Wii? We only had a Wii. Only had parents, a Wii? That's iconic. Said, what are you okay, talking about? Okay, at least they're standing up. And then they found out that that was not the case very quickly. Yeah. As we sat on the couch with our Wii remote. <clears> so. Oh, I love video games. I'm a, I'm literally a child. I, uh, yeah, I do too. Here at ABT, we have um, one of our core members, Nathan Vent. Shout out to Big Nate! Um, <laughs> he brings his switch in and hooks it up to the TV in the lounge and we play Smash or Mario Kart during breaks and it is truly the best. It's great. Especially after like hard rehearsals to just meet up with your buddies in the lounge and you know, beat each other up on screen. It's really yeah. fun. Just turn into a marshmallow. Just... Yes, exactly. Okay, uh, you gotta go get ready for the show. It's almost half oh hour on um, a Wednesday. This is episode five of The Stage Right Side. This is Jake Roxander. You can follow him on Instagram, at Jake Roxander, correct? Yes. Jake's not short for anything, right? Jacob. Really? Technically, yeah. It's not, um... Jacoby. Jaquilius. Jaquilius. Um, uh, Jacqueline. Jacqueline. Uh, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis JK, Roxander. Yes, JKO is named after me. I knew it. I don't it. know if you knew that, but... You're actually, yes. you're, you're uh, Benjamin Button. Yes. You were born really old, and yeah. now, I mean, 100 years later, things are derailing here on the stage right side. <laughs> Y'all come back now, you hear? Thank you so much for coming on, Jake. Anytime. Yeah, this was fun. Hell yeah. We'll do it again. Bye, y'all. Ciao. Oh, also, um, before I forget, don't you dare touch that dial on your old-timey TV, because I'm looking to get some fresh new podcast equipment for this here podcast on the stage right side. And you can click in the show notes and donate to this podcast so I can get fierce new microphones so the sound quality can be upgraded, hunty. So I would love it. You give $5, $10, 15 million, 17 million. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Then they'll be able to hear how nasally I really sound. Yeah. How nasally I really sound. Hi. It'll be even more nasally next time. <laughs> All right, you got it. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Bye, guys.